Hello Dragons and welcome to this instructional video for Lesson 2, Part 2, our two-party system. The main idea behind this civics lesson is our political system is dominated by two parties, but third-party influence has been historically significant. A third party can cause another party's defeat or press for issues ignored by the other two parties. With that in mind, by the end of watching this video, you will be able to summarize the history of political parties in the United States, describe the role of third parties in our democracy, compare the organization and basic beliefs of the two major parties, explore how people choose which political party to support, and explain how party strength has changed. Now that the outcomes for this lesson have been shared with you, let's get started. Even though political parties are an important part of American government, they aren't mentioned in the United States Constitution. In fact, George Washington feared that conflict between political parties might destroy the new democracy. He warned against the baneful or harmful effect of the spirit of party in his farewell address in 1796. However, even at the birth of our nation, Americans were banding together in groups, each with different ideas about the role of government. There were those who supported a strong central government, called the Federalists, and those who feared it, called the Anti-Federalists. The first political parties arose out of these different views of the role of government. Alexander Hamilton, President Washington's Secretary of the Treasury, led the first political party, the Federalist Party. The Federalists, who wanted a strong national government, had the support of merchants and bankers. The party's power declined in the early 1800s. The rival of the Federalists was the Democratic-Republican Party, led by Thomas Jefferson. This party opposed a strong national government and supported the power of the individual states. The Democratic-Republican Party had the support of farmers and frontier settlers. In 1828, under the leadership of Andrew Jackson, the party took the name the Democratic Party. The Democrats gained support from immigrant workers as well as farmers. The Whig Party, organized in 1834, opposed the Democrats. The Whigs opposed a strong executive branch of government. The Whigs and the Democrats remained rivals until the early 1850s. Our current two-party system emerged in 1854. In that year, the Republican Party was born, replacing the Whigs as a major party. The Republican Party was formed by groups opposed to slavery. It supported business interests and, at first, was purely a party of the North. In 1860, Abraham Lincoln became the first Republican president. The Republican Party remained the majority party from the Civil War until the Great Depression of the 1930s. It dominated both the presidency and the Congress during those years. A major shift in party power began in 1932 when Franklin Roosevelt, a Democrat, was elected president. Roosevelt's New Deal programs were designed to bring the country out of the Great Depression. Since then, power has shifted back and forth between Democrats and Republicans. Even though ours is a two-party system, third parties do arise, especially during presidential election years. Sometimes a third party forms to support a cause or idea. When the Republican Party formed in opposition to slavery, it was actually a third party to the Democrats and the Whigs. A second reason why a third party forms is to back a candidate, often the one who splits from a main party. In 1912, former President Theodore Roosevelt failed to win the Republican nomination for president. With a strong following, Roosevelt formed the Progressive, or Bull Moose Party. The Bull Moose Party disappeared after Roosevelt lost that election. Third party candidates face many problems. It may be difficult to get on the ballot because election laws in many states favor the two major parties. People often hold back from donating money because they doubt that a third party candidate can win. Also, even people who agree with the third party's ideas often decide that voting for its candidate 
would be wasting their vote. Even though third parties rarely win major elections, they still play an important role in American politics. A third party candidate can change the outcome of an election by drawing votes away from one of the major parties. In 1912, Theodore Roosevelt won many votes that would otherwise have gone to the Republican candidate, President William Howard Taft. As a result, Woodrow Wilson, a Democrat, won the 1912 election. Third parties can also play a key role by bringing up new ideas, or pressing for action on certain issues. In the 1992 election, independent candidate Ross Perot made the national debt a major issue, forcing the Republican and Democratic candidates to talk about the problem more directly. Perot got 19% of the popular vote, the strongest showing for a third-party presidential candidate in 80 years. Hoping to transform this support into a permanent political party, Perot formed the Reform Party in 1995. Perot ran as the Reform Party's candidate for president in 1996, receiving 8% of the vote. What do the major parties really stand for? One way to answer this question is to look at a party's platform. Generally, the Democratic Party believes that the federal government should take responsibility for many social programs, such as aid to the poor. Democrats are more likely than Republicans to support tax increases, if needed, to pay for these programs. Over the years, the Democratic Party has also been more likely to support labor unions. The Republican Party generally supports reducing the power of the federal government. Republicans tend to believe that state and local governments, as well as non-government organizations, should take more responsibility for social programs. They are also supporters of a strong military. When you look at the two parties, you can see differences. However, when the party in office or the majority party in the legislature changes, we do not usually have a radical change in government policies. Why not? The answer lies in the fact that, in many ways, our two major political parties are similar. Americans believe in equal respect and share values of freedom, justice, and equality for all. The two political parties have different historical traditions and see the role of government differently. However, the parties, like the American people they represent, hold the same basic values and beliefs. Furthermore, in order to win elections, both parties need broad support. Each party tries to attract members from a broad spectrum of people, rich and poor, white collar and blue collar, rural and urban. To keep the support of all these different groups, both parties avoid taking extreme stands on issues. Each party also tries to attract the votes of the large number of voters who are not strongly committed to either party. The Democratic and Republican parties are also similar in the way they are set up. Both parties have local, state, and national organizations. These organizations work independently of each other. In other words, there is no single authority making decisions for the whole party. Individual members of the local level are the most important part of any party. These members do the job of getting the party's candidates elected. Each community is divided into precincts or voting districts. Precincts are made up of generally less than a thousand voters who all vote at the same polling place. In each precinct, each party has a chairperson or captain who organizes volunteers to try to get as many party members as possible to vote. Parties at the local level elect members to city and county committees. These committees may recommend candidates for office and are responsible for running local campaigns. Each party is also organized at the state level. Most states have party committees, each with a chairperson. At state conventions, party leaders write the state party platform and nominate candidates for office. Party leaders also raise money and help with candidates' campaigns. Once every four years, each party holds a national convention. At the convention, delegates write the national party platform and nominate the candidates for president and vice president. Between national conventions, the national committee helps keep the party running. During election years, the national committee helps the candidates for president and vice president run their campaigns. It also works to elect members of Congress and to raise funds for the party. Membership in a political party is not like membership in a club. 
You do not need to pay dues or attend meetings. All you need to do is think of yourself as a member. In some states, you can officially declare your party when you register to vote. Even so, you are free to vote for any party's candidates in general elections and to change your party registration whenever you wish. How do you decide which party to support or whether to support a party at all? One influence is your family. If you grow up listening to your parents talk about politics, you may come to share their views. The views of friends, co-workers, and teachers may also influence you. If people you respect support a party, you too may choose to back that party. Your views on issues may also influence which political party you support. If you take a strong stand on an issue, you are more likely to back a party that shares your view. Also, if you like certain candidates and agree with their opinions, you may be attracted to their party. Parties depend for their strength on their ability to elect their candidates. In order to be successful in elections, parties must have dedicated members to work on campaigns. Historically, political parties have maintained their strength through a combination of three elements. Number one, a system of patronage. Number two, a central role in election campaigns. And number three, voter loyalty. Each of these elements has changed in recent years. The system in which party leaders do favors for loyal supporters of the party is called patronage. Today, some patronage is still possible, especially at high levels. For example, the president often appoints loyal party members to cabinet positions. However, many people now get government jobs through the civil service system. As a result, the patronage system has decreased, though there are still 2,000 federal appointments and many state and local as well. Another way in which party strength has changed is in the party's roles in campaigns. In earlier times, candidates for office worked within the party and depended on party support in their campaigns. Today, candidates can more easily strike out on their own and run a campaign apart from the party. They can raise their own campaign funds, buy television ads, and print their own pamphlets. When candidates are less dependent on party help, they may be less bound to support the party's programs. A third change that has weakened political parties is a change in voter loyalty. Only 40% of people now vote a straight ticket, the practice of voting for the candidates of only one party. Voters now tend to base their decisions on the appeal of a particular candidate or issue rather than on party loyalty. Many people now vote a split ticket, the practice of voting for candidates of more than one party on the same ballot. As a result of split ticket voting, parties can no longer count on a certain core of party votes in an election. In 2014, for example, Michigan voters re-elected Republican Governor Rick Snyder while electing a Democrat, Gary Peters, as the state's new U.S. Senator. A recent poll found that 34% of American voters considered themselves Democrats, while 28% considered themselves Republicans. How do the rest of the voters think of themselves? Recent studies show that approximately 35% are independent voters people who do not support a particular political party. This number is highest among young voters. However, a certain percentage of independent voters leans towards one party or the other. Some observers claim that the influence of political parties is weakening, that the party is over. Others believe that our two-party system will stay in place, but that the parties will change in response to changing times. So that's the way it is with Lesson 2, Part 2, our two-party system. At this point, you should know that the American two-party system has a long history within the United States. Third parties have presented new ideas into the political system. The Republican and Democratic parties are organized in similar ways. And being a member of a political party is each citizen's decision, and the two major political parties have seen their support decline for various reasons. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel to have the entire catalog of civics videos available at your fingertips. Click the subscribe button and then click the follow bell to receive notifications as to when the channel is updated. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you in class dragons. See ya!